Speaker Beat. It's Monday, August 8th, 2011, and this week's Speaker Beat, it's been considered the holy grail of growth for drug makers. But now new government rules could impact profits in China. Find out why. Plus, Wall Street and worldwide markets got spooked last week, but what do the top life sciences industry execs think of the economy? We'll let you know. And is your iPhone a medical device? For those managing a common ailment, there's an app for that. All that and more in this week's edition of Beaker Beat, brought to you by Allergan. To learn more about Allergan, visit their company webpage on Beaker.com. Welcome to this week's edition of Beaker Beat. I'm Mike Justice. Thanks for tuning in. One of my favorite shows in Jeremy's is Magnum P.I. We love that show. So we're doing our own little Magnum P.I. thing. Got the horrifying Hawaiian shirt, the tiger's cap, and the hot red convertible. All right, so it's not a Ferrari. What do you want me to do? They're not paying me that much to do this show. Come on, give me a break. Anyway, here's this week's top story. The proverbial gold rush into China's burgeoning drug market may be coming to an end soon. The reason? The Chinese government is trying to tame the Wild West mentality, or in this case East, in an effort to make medicines cheaper for 700 million rural people. A new way to buy essential drugs being tested in Anhui province caused drug prices to fall by as much as 90 percent. The system, which encourages drug makers to compete on price and quality for state contracts, may go national. It could expand to include other medicines as well. This has dragged China's biggest health care stocks down 26% this year, and plans to expand the program to wealthy cities may also hurt giants like Pfizer and Merck. Foreign companies don't like this, of course, claiming it will force them to lower prices to compete with generic drug makers. That may erode the profit earned in the world's fastest growing pharma market, which was worth $41 billion last year. Big Pharma has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in China. Novartis's $1 billion is a perfect example, and companies want a big return on that investment. One of Big Pharma's key strategies for emerging markets is branded generics designed to capture a premium price. Consumers tend to be more confident in a well-known drug maker's name, especially where counterfeiting is common. Now, This isn't the first time the Chinese government has talked of cutting drug prices charged by foreigners, which are currently exempt from many price reductions. One local deputy health director has no sympathy for drug makers, stating, quote, if there are drug companies that fail, we will let them fail. It's not our responsibility to help them survive. Ugh, this thing's dirty. What a mess. I'm sure Magnum never let his car get this dirty. Anyway, tell us what you think about this story or any story that you see in today's show. It's very simple. Click an orange button below me. A box will pop up. Type in your comments. Send it to me. I promise I'll read and respond to every one of them. And if you need some detective work, I'm your guy. Now, as far as getting this thing cleaned up, I need to find someone who will work for cheap. And when you're done watching Beaker B, check out Beaker's blog and read FDA Commissioner Margaret Hamburg's op-ed piece she submitted to the Wall Street Journal. That story and more on Beaker's blog. So I got this dent here when I was tangling with some bad guys, saving a damsel in distress. Nah, not really. That's the plot line of every Magnum PI. Actually, a truck tried to run me off the road. Good times. A new survey of 100 pharma executives reveals they feel the same way many Americans do. They expect difficult times ahead. The KPMG survey shows the most optimistic execs, just 30%, see economic recovery by the end of 2012, while the least optimistic, or 27%, predict recovery by the end of 2014. The hiring picture looks rough, too, as only 41% of the executives said they'd be adding to their payrolls in 2012. Even worse, almost one quarter expect hiring to, quote, never return to pre-recession levels, end quote. Also of note, the survey shows 83% of pharma officials say they expect their companies to either buy or be bought over the next two years. All right. Well, I found my car washers. Cheap free labor. Children. Yeah, they're good for something, right? Anyway, time for quick hits. Hey, you missed the spot. Merck will eliminate up to 13,000 jobs, or about 14% of its workforce. The drug giant said the layoffs would be in addition to some 17,000 job cuts already planned, a grand total of about 30,000 jobs. Now, Merck will also cut spending by an extra $1.3 billion by the end of 2015. Also contributing to the savings are the closings of unspecified offices and manufacturing plants. Like a Nicolas Cage movie, the device industry had an immediate negative reaction last week. But this isn't a horrible film they can walk away from. It's in response to the FDA's release of a draft guidance on 510K device modification. The industry claims the requirements could result in an exodus of device makers from the U.S. Meanwhile, a report by the Institute of Medicine suggests the FDA should abandon its 510K device clearance process altogether. 
IOM thinks FDA should develop a new regulatory framework for low and moderate risk medical devices. We'll have more fallout from this story next week. Novartis' new multiple sclerosis drug has hit a snag. The UK's cost-effectiveness watchdog gave it a thumbs down based mostly on efficacy data, but the high cost didn't help. At 19,000 pounds in the UK, it's cheaper than in the US, but still not cheap. In the cost-effectiveness balance, a big weight on the cost side has to be offset by more impressive data on the efficacy side. Novartis was not happy about the decision, and patient groups immediately began planning their protests. Stay tuned to see how this plays out. Roche plans to sell its 256-employee manufacturing plant in Boulder, Colorado. International Chemical Investors Group will buy it for use by the company's Cordon Pharma Group. Stop me if you've heard this before. A quality control problem at Genzyme has disrupted shipments of Fabrizyme again. The treatment for Fabry's disease is already running short as supplies have not returned to normal levels since Genzyme had to shut down a Boston area plant because of viral contamination. Now owned by Sanofi, the company has been promising to return to normal supply levels soon. However, they just announced that production isn't likely to meet the goals set to qualify for a milestone payment to ex-Genzyme shareholders. Google will terminate its Google Labs project, a website where the public could test early stage projects for possible development. Among the casualties, Google Health and Google Body. Some of Google's best ideas, like Google Maps and Gmail, came from Google Labs. That's a lot of Google. Hey, you guys missed a spot. We're hot and thirsty. Can we get a drink? I'll give you a drink. <laughs> Checking Money Matters now, and last week's stock market losses seemed like a biotech bloodbath. Sector stocks got hammered, dragging down the NYSE ARCA Biotechnology Index by over 10% to an eight-month closing low. Dendrion helped to drag down the sector, plummeting 67% in one day. The sharp drop by shares of Dendrion came after the company withdrew its full-year revenue guidance amid weaker-than-expected sales of its prostate cancer therapy Provenge. Dendrion also announced plans to slash costs, partly through layoffs. Interestingly, Dendrion CEO Michael Gold unloaded $1 million worth of Dendrion stock last month, about the time the company scheduled its earnings release. I'm sure no one will notice. Germany's Fresenius Medical Care has agreed to buy two U.S.-based dialysis companies for a combined total of about $2 billion. The German outfit offers products and services for individuals undergoing dialysis as a result of chronic kidney failure. The company will merge with Liberty Dialysis Holdings in a $1.7 billion deal and will buy American Access Care Holdings for $385 million. The merger is subject to regulatory approval, of course, and is expected to close early next year. All right, everybody, nice work for free labor. Good job. We go play now? <laughs> If you mean play, wash these two other cars, then yes. Aww. Researchers at Northeastern University in Boston are developing an iPhone application designed to monitor blood glucose levels in patients with diabetes without the standard finger pricking. The technology makes use of fluorescent nanoparticle solutions injected into the skin and an iPhone in a modified case that tracks changes in the level of fluorescence, revealing the amount of sodium or glucose present. Now, diabetes iPhone apps started showing up back in 2009 from several leading life sciences companies, including Sanofi, J&J, &J, etc. All of these work the same, integrating readings from a standard blood glucose monitor. But until now, none had actually made the leap from software assistant to diagnostics monitor. To our knowledge, this is the first attempt to turn a smartphone into a legitimate medical device as defined by the FDA. Maybe one day Apple can make room for a vial of insulin in the iPhone. All right, the roof's in. Time to take this thing for a ride and drum up some private eye business. That's it for this week's edition of Beaker Beat. I'm Mike Justice. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. If we survive. All right, Jeremy, time to get in. Oh, it's dead. Sit, Beaker. Sit. Good dog.